from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. My name is Georgia Lukens and I am sitting with Joel Spiegelman and Marty Boykin. And we're here today to discuss some of the musical issues uh, or exciting aspects, they're all exciting of course, um, of composer Irving Fine. Uh, just quickly, Joel Spiegelman is a pianist, composer, conductor, harpsichordist, teacher, author, musical impresario. Uh, he studied at Yale, University of Buffalo, Brandeis University, at the Paris Conservatoire with Nadia Boulanger. He was part of the Boulangerie. Um, and in Russia at the Moscow Gnesin Institute and the Leningrad Conservatory. He taught at Brandeis University, US, UC San Diego, and at Sarah Lawrence College. He's played uh, for Leonard Bernstein in the 1960s, recorded Fine's symphonic works, and introduced a great number of uh, so-called forbidden Soviet composers to the US, including concerts at the Library of Congress. Uh, more recently, he's been involved in music education advocacy in Greenland, setting up children's music education projects there. Marty Boykin is Professor Emeritus at Brandeis University where he taught composition for many years. He also taught at Columbia, NYU and Bar Ilan University and the American Academy in Berlin. He's a composer, a pianist and essayist. He has two books of essays out and uh, he's known for his many compositions which have won awards such as the Jeunesse Musicale Award for his first string quartet, uh, and the League ISCM Award for Elegy, a Rockefeller Grant, NEA Awards, and he was a Guggenheim Fellow. Uh, he's received commissions from the Fromm Foundation, from the Kusevitsky Fund, uh, the Library of Congress, and in 2011, he was elected into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Welcome both gentlemen. So we've learnt and listened a lot about neoclassicism. When we think about Irving Fine, we think about this, this period and school of composition. And something really exciting that we can talk about today is the reaction that Irving Fine, his contemporaries and his teachers had to the so-called compositional war, if you like, between the neoclassicists and the serialists, most particularly where Irving Fine and his contemporaries came down in the Stravinsky v. Schoenberg battle. Um, we need to know that Irving Fine studied with Nadia Boulanger, uh, as did uh, Joel Spiegelman, and Irving Fine also studied with Piston, Walter Piston, as did Marty Boykin. And I'm curious um, if perhaps we can talk for a moment about where Irving Fine existed on this trajectory between neoclassicism and uh, serialism. We know that Boulanger certainly didn't particularly advocate for serialist technique. She did own um, a, a theory and harmony book written by Schoenberg, which Copeland gave her in 1923. Uh, but she was not particularly in favour of serialist techniques beyond accepting them as part of the, the musical environment of her time. I'm wondering, Marty, if you could start us off. Um, how do you see Piston and Boulanger influencing the works of Irving Fine? Um, well, uh, that's a very hard question. And also hard because... Um, Walter Piston was himself a student of Boulanger. Yes. So that um, uh, I have no personal, no, I, I met Boulanger a couple of times, but I've, I have no personal uh, notion of how she taught. But I do remember something that Walter Piston said about her, which is that um, she was an extraordinary teacher because she had a, 
an immediate feeling for the kind of statement a composer wanted to make. So it wasn't just what you should be doing, but what the individual creator was trying to do. Um, as far as what she learned, what, what Irving learned from, um, from uh, Walter Piston, I have to say, now bear with me, that I am quite sure, uh, because I studied with, with Piston for quite a few years, but many years after Irving, but unless a Piston had significantly changed in those years, I'm sure that Irving learned nothing from Piston. <laughs> I, this is not a joke, it was a serious matter. He really knew that, he taught nothing. Uh, he simply called himself a spectator. And I remember one time when uh, he looked at a piece of mine and corrected a few mistakes in the accidentals. And then I asked him, was uh, a certain part of the piece too, too long? He said, yes. And I was very angry. He was right, because this was a finished piece and I had worked on it with him and he never told me it's too long. If I didn't, if I didn't know it, nothing, nothing happened. But I want to say, when I've said that, that he is one of the great American composers and a very important composer. And at the time when uh, I was learning nothing from him in the classroom, I was learning a great deal from him uh, in studying his music. So I didn't want to say that. Um, the, the American composer of, uh, who, from whom Irving would have learned anything was, of course, Aaron Copland. Mm. Um, and the composer who was prime in his life was, of course, Igor Stravinsky. And I'll stop there. Okay. <clears throat> Perhaps, Joel, because you were part of the uh, boulangerie, so to speak, but later than Copeland and Virgil Thompson and Irving <coughs> Fine, perhaps you'd like to tell us how Irving Fine's music fits in with the overall context of Boulanger's students. You know, I tend to agree, concur with Marty when he said Irving probably learned nothing from Walter Piston, in a sense, uh, in, in one sense. I, uh, having spent four years with Boulanger, and basically, uh, was inspired to go there and, and work with her because of Irving and his colleagues who are my teachers at uh, Brandeis, Harold Shapiro and, and um, Arthur Berger, all of whom I, I believe had worked with her, at least Harold had, for a period of time. Um, I can only uh, say that when I was once asked what I learned from her, okay, I said, I learned that when I came to Boulanger, my music sounded like I had just come from her. And when I left Boulanger after four years, my music sounded like I had never heard of her. Uh, now, what, did, what does that mean? And I, that meant that, and they asked me, I, basically a sense of uh, heightened conscience uh, of hearing in the ear. And I think that what Irving, may have absorbed from both Piston and Boulanger was, and what's exhibited in his music is integrity. There's an extraordinary uh, uh, integrity in terms of the craftsmanship in his music. Uh, as I recall, and, uh, with my lessons with Boulanger, she never told me how to write, what to write. She would comment very little uh, and uh, she might say, well, you should forget this work, <laughs> go on to another one, but nothing too much more than that. She would never get into the act of uh, composing. What she had us do, and I, I'm sure Irving went through this also, basically we're going back to basics, very basics, uh, ex theoretical uh, exercises, but um, the actual work on a composition, uh, whether it be mine or anyone else's, and I'm sure Irving's also, she never really got, got into. I think he came away with the, uh, this spirit of integrity. Also, he came away with the spirit of France, 
which shows up in his music from time to time. <laughs> How would you characterize this French aesthetic? A certain lightness and a certain, you know, humor, okay, and a, <laughs> that uh, I can't say it's the humor, let's say, that we have or the American in Paris type, but no, that basically I smell Paris in, 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 in works like Diversion, things of that sort. That, uh, um, and there's a, a, a you know, when, when, I, when I look at uh, this next to other com French composers, like Jean Francais, Francis Poulenc, uh, not that he uh, is similar, but they are also neoclassics. Mm. I hate to use that word, neoclassic, or, or whatever, because uh, I don't think we should really uh, divide music into those categories, but um, there is a certain sharing to a certain degree of, of spirit in the music. Okay, thank you. Marty, when we think about how Fine's music evolved, when we look at a score, when we look at a score such as the Fantasia or the String Quartet, do we get a sense of how this relates to the tension I spoke of a little earlier uh, that was existing at this point in uh, musical composition between Stravinsky and Schoenberg, considering that Stravinsky accused Schoenberg of destroying all that was, I think the quote is, beautiful, clear and sound in music, and Schoenberg thought he was an unregenerate who wouldn't fight for new uh, musical style or technique. Do we get a sense, looking at some of Fine's works, where he came down? Obviously, there's not a tone row in uh, the two works I mentioned, to the best of my knowledge. Maybe I need to revisit my harmony exercises. But where did Fine or Fine's music as a composer, when you look at a score, uh, embrace or in somehow relate to the works of Stravinsky? Uh, um, tell, me, tell me again what you just said. I, How do, yes, I'm sorry, there was a long lead up. How do the works of Irving Fine yep. relate to the so-called Stravinsky aesthetic? Oh, well, very closely. Um, his early works are, uh, he, you know, his uh, dissertation at Brandeis was on the harmony of Stravinsky. Yes. And that is something that he really, he didn't write because he had to write a dissertation and find a subject, but it's something he was really involved in. And there's no question that the basic, um, uh, prim, uh, the place he began from as a composer was, was Stravinsky. He told me himself once uh, that the neoclassic, in quotes, I like to put quotes around it in this case, that the neoclassic style was, uh, idea was really started by Arthur Berger. Okay. Um, and that he was interested in and got onto it because it looked like the most difficult and the most unlikely. Um, and in fact, I can remember as a, you know, as a young guy that it was absolutely essential whenever you mentioned Stravinsky in any context whatsoever to make it clear that his great works were the three ballets and that there was a great, uh, uh, that he just went downhill after that in a terrible way. And this was the whole music world um, until, I don't know, the 1950s, 1960s, or something like that. Um, and uh, so as for Irving's connection with, um, with the music of Schoenberg, I have a very personal... Um, I have a very personal story to tell. I have a very personal experience of that. Because when I was, uh, this is a million years ago, when I was a um, sophomore, I think, uh, I had studied with Steuermann, who was uh, uh, Schoenberg's pianist for many years, did the first performance of uh, Piero. And so I, I did a little performance of, of, of piano pieces. I don't remember, we were Opus 11, Opus 23, probably. Few others, I don't know, and a little talk on it. I didn't know anything, but it didn't matter. I did my talk, and I was startled to find that the entire, with one exception, on, on, on a graduate composer whose name I can't remember, the entire student body plus the entire faculty had never heard a note of Schoenberg. 
Uh, it was not just simply a fight between them, it was total ignorance of each other. And um, th this surprised me, and Irving, who had never heard any Schoenberg at this point, and we're now talking um, late 40s, early 50s, um, he was taken by it. Uh, there was something in it he, uh, that, you know, he mixed it up with my playing of it, which I'm quite sure was not at the top of the world, but it was what it was. And the music somehow spoke to him. There was, um, and so he began thinking of Stravinsky because uh, he did understand, as Arthur kept saying, that the neoclassic Stravinsky was great music. And he thought it was also the most unpopular and the most difficult. And, he, and so he started with that. And so there is an, an unquestionable Stravinsky style in, in, in Irving, as there is in Arthur and in Harold Shapiro and, and in the other, the other guys there. Um, when this whole thing changed, this whole war between the two changed, uh, and Irving began to write serially, though he said, always tonally, mm. without giving up tonality, he began actually to find himself. Um, and if I can say something that's probably irrelevant here, that war between Schoenberg and Stravinsky is just one of the stupidest and unhappiest things that happened in that whole century of stupid and unhappy and horrible things. Uh, because when Schoenberg uh, first started his concerts in Vienna of new music, he included the work of Stravinsky. And uh, Stravinsky was interested in Schoenberg until they decided, for political reasons, for whatever reasons, I don't want to know, that they wouldn't talk to one another. Until in the end, of course, Stravinsky turned over to become an atonal, actually, an atonal serial composer, which Irving did not. He, he saved the tonality. Thank you. Two words that Marty just used were difficult and unexpected. Uh, you've conducted a great many works of Irving Fines, and there's a recording of uh, symphonic works. I'm wondering, do you hear anything difficult or unexpected in Irving Fines' music? I would say uh, in the works that I have conducted that um, in terms of unexpected, I would like to substitute that for with spontaneous. Okay. Okay, because in other words, there was never uh, um, the uh, aspect of, uh, I at least in the s two works, let's say, serious song and the symphony, predictability. He worked the material in such a way that uh, there was an element of unpredictability as the material flowed. Uh, in other works, like the diversions, uh, I mean, they were set to a certain style and he kept to that. Uh, however, that, uh, these works, that work, um, uh, the music uh, for piano, which I orchestrated, became music for orchestra, also, basically um, uh, had a freshness. Uh, also, in terms of the, my uh, ability uh, to color it orchestrally, uh, had the feeling of um, sort of uh, no non-predictability as it moved along, okay, because you were hearing different colors, different things as it, uh, as, you, as you might not expect, because when I was orchestrating it, it was difficult because it was a piano piece and very pianistic. And I always kept in mind what Stravinsky said, 
if you think that this line is good for the strings, give it to the trumpet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, keeping that in mind, <laughs> I kept it as fresh as possible. Uh, but in terms of the music itself, and I'm listening again to the, the symphony, uh, uh, and was again impressed by the craftsmanship, okay, and the um, uh, freshness as the material uh, evolved, okay, from little bits and pieces, and how we worked together. And uh, certainly in the last movement, uh, which he calls Ode, and listening to it again, and, and since that work, as we know, uh, was uh, his last big work that was performed before he died, it's more like Judgment Day in, in terms of its uh, depth. And if that is predicted, that's, <laughs> it's in that work. <laughs> Okay, seeing as we seem to have now started a discussion about the 1962 symphony, I'm wondering if either of you would like to comment um, on where the symphony, what does the symphony say about the composer Fine may have been had he lived longer and continued to compose? Do we see a roadmap in this symphony or um, an evolution of style that perhaps um, had his life not been tragically cut short? we would have seen a, a further development of? Uh, the answer to all of that is absolutely yes. The last works, the last works are, are becoming very personal. Uh, and um, this was one early death which was a great blow for music as a whole. It was not that we simply don't have more pieces of his, but he was on the way. And I think he was aware of that too. Beginning with the quartet and the trio and, oh, excuse me, beginning with the quartet and the trio and, and such things. Um, I, if, I, if you give me a couple of minutes, I feel I have to say a word about where Irving stands in the so-called neoclassic um, uh, set. First of all, neoclassicism is a, is a bad, Yes, we've because um, Schoenberg was equally interested in the neo in, in classical form and in painting as well as in literature. Uh, you have James Joyce's Ulysses, which is modern, but which is of course also a rewriting of Homer's uh, Odyssey. Um, and uh, what distinguishes? Well, let, let me put it this way: here, here are the the three main. Um, neoclassic composers in America. Uh, if you start with um, Harold Shapiro, Harold was very concerned actually with basing it on a particular composer's work. And in his case, it came to be Beethoven. So he was essentially trying to rewrite Beethoven in somewhat modern terms. Um, he actually even wrote uh, an article for journal I can't remember now, a long time ago, saying that what music must do from now on is simply to copy what some particular composer did in the past. Um, what you have with Arthur Berger is a strong sense of the harmony, just pitches, um, very little interest in his own words in, in phrasing, in in the shape of a piece and so forth. And what you have from Irving is um, a sort of innate connection with Stravinsky first and Copland second, uh, but simply writing without these uh, abstract theoretical notions of what, you know, what classicism means. Uh, simply writing a piece which is tonal because that's the way he's thinking. So that it was very natural for him later on to turn that tonality into, into something uh, which is a little different, which is, uh, uh, has many more possibilities, perhaps, is, is, is what he was thinking. But most of all, which represented his own personal uh, uh, sense of what he wanted a piece of music to be. 
Okay, and perhaps one final question as we're running a little short on time. Um, something that Marty brought up just now was the relationship between uh, this period of music and modernist literature and artworks and the example you gave was James Joyce's Ulysses which in itself is as we know an appropriation over another sort of and I'm going to use the quote marks now, classical text, but classical in the sense of the Odyssey. Um, as appropriation and adaptation becomes such a key feature of the arts, literature, music, um, and the visual arts, I'm wondering if um, either of you would care to comment on what this meant for Irving's compositional evolution or style. Is there a sense of appropriation? And I don't mean in any sort of negative sense. I mean in terms of a, a colour or a characteristic. Uh, we think of Alice in Wonderland as being, obviously, these pieces. It's an appropriation. It's taking a narrative and turning it into a musical narrative. Do we have any other examples of Fine's works that do this, that appropriate an idea or a piece of literature, an artwork? I can't, no, I, uh, no, I can't associate that in, her, in his work, actually. I see that Irving as composer was slowly developing, basically, uh, through the, uh, basically, the height of his work in terms of his lifespan, his symphony, and with the hope that that opened up really new vistas and doors and going on, but I don't see uh, exactly what you're, you know, what you're speaking about, any kind of appropriation of anything okay. like that. Uh, he did not try to rewrite Stravinsky. No. <laughs> okay. He did, as Marty said, uh, Shapiro may have been working on rewriting Beethoven a bit, <laughs> uh, but I don't see, I see elements, okay, elements, small elements in Irving's work that were, you know, quote, unquote, a bit Stravinsky in, okay. Uh, I see uh, even, you know, some type of influence of the, uh, of the Russian school, what they would, from, uh, but it's, to a small degree, because Irving was a, an American composer, there was an American spirit to it, and it's interesting that when I conducted his works in Russia, the players and the audience absolutely took to it very well. I want to add to that. First of all, I want to um, agree entirely uh, with e exactly what you were saying, that there is no uh, attempt to reproduce another composer or do anything like that. Uh, Arthur Berger used to tell me that he thought that Irving was heavily influenced by the um, songs of Dutier, the early music. Um, about which I have no comment because I don't know that music. Um, like any composer, like any decent composer, Irving studied a lot of music because he cared about it, and there are things he picked up. And he may have this connection with Dutier, maybe real or not, I don't know. Um, but uh, one does have a sense going through his work that it is a gradual, it starts very Stravinsky, and there's no question. I, when I first heard it, I thought it was Stravinsky. <laughs> I thought this was great music, this is fabulous, this is, this is obviously Stravinsky. And I was wrong, it was very fine. <laughs> uh, but that's true of a lot of composers who started from elsewhere. Uh, and some great ones like Verdi and Wagner who started from nowhere. Uh, literally nowhere, and um, but he was a, essentially developing his own style, his own way of thinking, and that's what counts. Absolutely. Um, <coughs> I think we're pretty much out of time, but if either of you have any concluding comments you'd like to make about Irving Fine, I'm sure we have... 60 seconds, um, if you can really sum up someone um, of such great artistic um, output and uh, really wonderful, wonderful composer. If you have anything further to say um, about style or aesthetic or even where to from here when we look at Fine's works. Just that um, um, it's unfortunate that he passed away so young because I believe he was opening the doors to some, some really musical greatness. 
and there was a, a, a largesse and uh, depth, especially, you know, that, that the symphony showed us. That uh, it's unfortunate that that couldn't continue in further works. Mm. Any? I would just second all of those words. I, I think. think. We're in agreement that we all want to hear a great many of these compositions and with that in mind I'm looking forward to the performances later this afternoon and this evening where we'll have the opportunity to hear a few. Thank you so much gentlemen for joining me today and discussing this truly remarkable composer and thank you for listening. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.